Welcome to Valley Grove Baptist Church, located at 1731 South, U.S. Highway 281 in Stephenville, Texas. We are glad you joined us for our 1030 Sunday morning worship service. If you'd like to learn more about Valley Grove, please check us out at our website at valleygrove.net. Now, join us for the morning worship service already in progress.
right, so this is what I brought for us to eat. Are y'all ready? I brought Pierce. He's my fish. Do y'all think we can eat him? No. Why not? Because he's alive. He's alive, like he's the wrong fish. Why is he wrong? the wrong fish? He's got a tiny hook. Yeah, he's just a beta fish. I keep him on my desk. We can't eat him, can we? So I didn't really bring anything to this meal, did I? No, no, I didn't. Okay, so how many of y'all have heard of the feeding of the 5,000? How many of y'all know that story? Raise your hand if you know it. Okay, so Jesus um, is like been resting and relaxing and he gets back to um, the shore and there's thousands of people hanging out and waiting for him there. And so what happens is he like asks them to gather around and hangs out and shares some stories with him and kind of with them. And then um, he's like, the disciples are like, hey, let's go. Like these people need to go home. And he's like, no, no, why don't we feed them? And they're like, we cannot afford to feed 5,000 people. And he's like, yes, we can. Let's do this. So what happens is, is they find five loaves and two fish and then it multiplies, right? Jesus performs a miracle makes all of this food for Daddy, very little. Daddy. So I have a question. Just like, or not a question, I have a statement. Just like Pierce like wasn't enough, and just like they didn't have enough, but Jesus multiplied what they had, um, God does that for us. So what happens is, is we come to Christ, and we don't have anything to give him. We have nothing to give him. But what happens is Christ totally takes our lives and transforms us because Jesus wants to have a relationship with us. How many of y'all know um, Romans 3.23? You know it, can you see? You forgot. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many of y'all know that verse? How many of y'all know the verse after it? Romans 3.24. It's kind of looked over. So it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption that is Christ Jesus. So we don't bring anything to the table, but guess what, guys? Jesus does, and so we are redeemed by him. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for saving us. Thank you for loving us, um, and thank you for providing for us when we have nothing. Um, God, we love you, and we thank you for today. We pray this in Jesus' name. struggles or in victories, in need or in want, I found that it's sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen? Let's stand together. Let's sing that hymn together. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Trust to
Yeah. 
pray that each person knows that. But Lord, I know that our flesh sometimes allows us to want to take control of circumstances. Sometimes our life wants to take control of our life and do what we want. But Father, you are worthy to do. Lord, you gave us every breath that we take and everything that we have is yours, Father. So Lord, help us to do that. Help us to relinquish our hands from what you've given us. And Lord, help us to turn it over to you. And Lord, that includes, Lord, what we have financially. God, you have given us a place to worship. Not only just the things that we have, Lord, you've given us a place to worship, Lord. And your word says that we are, we're commanded to do this, Father, to give back to you what you've given to us. So, Lord, help us not to have fists that are clenched together but hands that are open, Lord, to give to you. So, Lord, I pray that you bless this offering, and I pray you use it in my mind. Lord, I pray for Brother Warren as he comes in a few moments to break open the word that I just pray you use him. Use the word that you've laid upon his heart in a mighty way. And I pray that God today would fall upon the hearts that are in here and fall upon a good ground today. And it would take, take root. For we are nothing without you. And so Lord, today, help us to just use what you've given us, Lord, as a mighty tool for your glory. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done, Lord Jesus. In the name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I talk to BSM directors across the state. 
um, that do not have churches like we do in Stephenville, that love and, and love them well. So thank you for that. Um, but while I've got the Britney Spears style mic, and therefore the power to capture your attention for the morning, um, and I'm not on staff here at Valley Grove, I get to say thank you to the staff at Valley Grove, man, Brother Ward, Rob, um, Jeremy, Miss Anita that works in the office, I mean, they, they lead us and shepherd us well. Um, and I know that they can't say that from the mic, but man, it's a hard job. Um, and so if you will, will you just, will you just take this one?
those are the patterns that you set in, in that age demographic are the patterns that you repeat consistently for the rest of your life. And so what better way to influence the world for, their, for the gospel and for God than to get them at 18 and start a consistent pattern of diving into the Word, answering yes to when God calls us to things, and walking from there, okay? So when I, right now God has called my family to Charleston State University. That's our main mission field. Okay, and so naturally when I read the Bible, when I get passionate about things, it always connects back to the college campus. Okay, so I apologize. It's like, man, why is he referencing Tarleton so many times? Like, I just don't get it. That's fun. Okay, and I'm really sorry about that. But for, for you, I hope you have a primary mission field. And so when I say Tarleton, just, just put your primary mission field there. Okay, if you don't, I would suggest praying about it. Figure out what that is. Okay, but... Um, with that being said, I, I, let me give a brief BSM kind of report and then kind of ask you for some prayer requests, okay? Um, in about three weeks, 2,000 freshmen will, will descend on Stephenville. Some of them for the first time, some of them have lived there their whole lives, but they'll arrive at Tarleton State University for transition week. These are 2,000 17, 18, 19 year olds um, who have the possibility to set patterns that will impact them for the rest of their lives. Kind of our mentality toward the first few weeks of school is we chase them really hard the first four weeks, or we're going to chase them the next four years. Okay, and as good stewards of the time and the people and opportunities that God gives us, we go all out for that four, first four weeks. Um, so if you will, if you'll join me and Meg, who did the, the children's sermon earlier, um, if you'll join us in, in praying for class of 2020, and that they be reached for the gospel, and that, that would be a class that transforms our community in our world, man, we would really appreciate that. Um, and I know there are opportunities as they come to Valley Grove and filter in and out of here, if we would just accept them and love them, just as you have the college students that are here and the college students that are, that are filed in and out through this weird, we'd really appreciate that. And you guys do a great job of that already. Um, but if you will, let's turn to John 6, 1 through 15. We're going to be hanging out in the feeding of the 5,000, um, just like Meg talked about. I'm glad we're not eating Pierce the Pet Fish. I appreciate that. He sits on Meg's desk at work, and uh, he doesn't like any of us, but it's okay. So if you'll turn to John 6, 1 through 15, um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump right into this, okay? God, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and worship you. Um, Lord, we know that you have done some incredible things throughout history, um, and you continue to do things even today. And so God, I pray as we look at the past and what you've done, I pray that we wouldn't distract our attention from what you're calling us to do in the here and the now. Um, and Lord, just that we would read the Bible with open eyes for you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Also, another thing I do when I get excited is I, I kind of walk over here and all over there, so I'm sorry. I hope that's not a distraction. But as we look at the feeding of the 5,000, we need to note a couple of key things. Let me kind of set up some background here, okay? Um, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only kind of happening um, besides the death and resurrection of Christ that is in all four Gospels, okay? So you've got, you know, Jesus lays Lazarus from, Lazarus from the dead. You've got... Um, Jesus turned the water into wine. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only one that's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? So obviously this is something that happened that really impacted the, the authors of the gospel. All right? So when we read that, we have to know that like, this isn't just a story that these people grew up with. I was raised in church. I, I was the same as many of you. I, I grew up in a church, went to Sunday school. Um, I knew all the answers. Like it was... It, Later turned me into an arrogant, a spiritually arrogant freshman in college, but like I, I knew the answers. And so when I read the Bible, when I read crazy miracles like the feeding of the 5,000, I just glossed over it. Okay? Um, but how we read the Bible is important. We can't just gloss over those things. We have to immerse ourselves in the culture, in the context that these verses come in. And we have to realize that when Jesus said certain things, like they were crazy. Like they were crazy for the time and the place that he said them. They were culturally counted, they were countercultural every time. Okay, and so like I, I, I usually put myself in the story. Um, I heard it one time, one of my mentors, um, he's in charge of all the, the interns for, for BSM. If you come to Big Feed, you'll come meet him. Um, which, by the way, thank you guys for making banana pudding. It's my absolute favorite. Side note, that's for free. Um, but one of my mentors always said, you know, the only difference, or the thing that you just did with the disciples is he picked 12 of them and said, hey, you should come on a three-year camping trip. 
Isn't that what they did? I mean, they traveled from place to place, lived off the land, but they were nomads. They traveled for three years. And what better way to get to know somebody, to learn from somebody, and to really know a person than by hanging out with them 24-7 for three years. No distractions. They didn't have their the newest iPhone. Like, there was no distractions. They just one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And so we have to put ourselves in a situation and realize that when they were sitting and talking, Jesus said some crazy things that took the disciples off guard. So I picture them sitting in a, and this is kind of a Warren translation, okay? They were sitting around kind of a fire at the end of a tough day, and Jesus is teaching. When Jesus is teaching, they always listen. So Jesus was teaching, and he said, you know, I've heard it said, and you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, if a man strikes you, turn to the other cheek. I can see the disciples leaning in. And he says that, it's like, what? It's like, that, Jesus, I've never heard that before in my life. What's he going to tell us next? That we need to give to Caesar what is Caesar? It's like, that's, there's no way. He just said, that's great. Jesus, Jesus. Like, these are things that they had never heard before. Completely countercultural. Things that they weren't used to hearing in church every day. So as we read the feeding of the 5,000, let's read that as well. In the feeding of the 5,000, there's an incredible story by itself. Jesus took nothing and used it for his glory by turning it into something. Um, and we'll see later that that's reflected in our own lives. But, for the most part, we're going to look at the different people surrounding Jesus and how they responded to him. Okay, so, in John, chapter 6, I'm going to read verse 1 through 15. Okay, we're going to just take a huge chunk of it um, and then come back, alright? So, John, chapter 6. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up his eyes then, and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. And one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who received them. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragment, fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. And perceiving then that they were about to come and take it by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Okay, so like I said a while ago, the main point of the passage we're going to look at this morning are three different people groups who responded to Jesus, okay? And to be honest, like I could do a whole series on each one of these people. But I only have one chance for you. So instead of like a 40 minute sermon, we're just going to do an hour and a half minute sermon. Okay? Just go. No? Okay. Um, so we're going to fly over at 30,000 feet. Okay? We're going to hit all three of these groups. The first group we're going to look at is the crowd. Okay? Jesus did something incredible. What did they do? What does this Bible verse say about the crowd? And so if you look at John 6, verse 2, actually, we're going to start at verse 1. Let's get crazy and go off notes. Um, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Okay, so you got this crowd of people, right? We learn later that's about 5,000 men, that's not including women and children, um, and that the feast of the Passover was near, okay? So that means people were traveling on a road um, more than usual, probably since the Passover was coming up. Um, but these people had been with Jesus for a while. Okay, they had seen Jesus do some crazy miracles. They had seen him sick. He was speaking with authority. It says earlier in the Gospels that um, they were amazed at the way that he spoke about Scripture. Because like certain teachers were like, this is what this man said about this passage in the Old Testament. But then Jesus shows up on the scene and says, this is what this means. He cuts out the middle man. And we know he can do that because he's the Son of God. But for them, like, this was crazy. That's not something you can do. Okay? So they were amazed at the fact that he spoke with authority on the scriptures. Um, but when they wake up one day, and this is how I picture in my head, okay? This is me immersing, immersing ourselves in the story. When they wake up one day, they've been following him, but some guy stands up and goes, Hey, where'd Jesus go? They look around, they can't find him. 
And then some guy with really good eyesight looks out and says, Wait, there's him and his disciples on a boat. They're headed to the other Sea of Galilee. The other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they all pick up their stuff and they walk around the, the tank. They walk around the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But guys, I was raised on a farm. Like, or not raised on a farm. My grandparents had a ranch. Um, and we loved to go fishing at these tanks. Okay? My wife, who is from Kansas, said they're not tanks. They don't fire artillery. Um, they are homemade ponds. Okay? That's what they are. But when we wanted to fish on the other side, we just grabbed a fishing pole or tackle box and we just walked to the other side. Right? It was like a five minute walk and it was a huge tank. Okay? This is not what the Sea of Galilee is. The Sea of Galilee is huge. For the people to get to the other side where Jesus was headed, they had to walk about nine miles. Okay? And they didn't show up in their Nike shops that day. Okay? They weren't ready for to like, make the trip. So they picked up their stuff. It required pain of them and effort to walk the nine miles around the other side. But they were so enamored and they were so amazed by the teachings and the things that he just did. They said, hey, it's worth it for us to go along to the other side. And we can assume and kind of imagine that as they traveled to the other side, they kept telling people about, hey, there's this guy, his name's Jesus. He's been teaching and doing some crazy things. You should come with us, right? Because they, it was, they, he'd been healing the sick. He was doing some crazy, he was saying some absolutely crazy things for the culture. And so they assembled people and they kept gathering people. And so they show up on the other side and there's 5,000 men in the camp. And so it says that, uh, Jesus went up on the mountain, and this is verse 3, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover and the feast of Jews was at hand, and lifting up his eyes then, and seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus had compassion on him. He said, let's speak. So this crowd descends on Jesus and sits around him and gets ready for him to teach, but it's supper time. Okay? So, um, every time that I read the Bible, we have to read it a little bit differently. Um, the, the example I use for my college students is, I love the Bible. I read the Bible every day. I love the Hunger Games. I read the Hunger Games a lot. Are they the same? No. Okay? The Hunger Games, fantastic literary piece. I mean, they did a great job in the movies. Well, you can tell I'm married to an English major. Like, movies, <laughs> fantastic. Okay? Um, but, when I read the Hunger Games, it will not shape my life. I'm not... When I read the Hunger Games and I find something in the Hunger Games that I disagree with or I don't know how I feel about it, I don't shape and conform my life to fit Katniss Everdeen. For those of you that have never read it, you're like, ooh, but don't worry about it, okay? Read it. After the Bible. Okay? But in the Bible, when I find something in it, it stirs me the wrong way, and I'm like, what does this mean? I research it, and I study it, and I pattern my life to look more like it. It's the Word of God. This is the words of, the words of an author, who's a fantastic author, not the Bible. Okay? So, when I read this about the crowd, I don't just leave it and say, man, the crowd, man, they walked nine miles. That's pretty crazy. Why did they do it? Okay, why did they walk nine miles? Um, and honestly, it's because they saw me just working and wanted to be a part of it. Um, which leads me to this question. For all my teaching stuff, I realized that Jesus with his disciples always ask questions. And so, the way I teach things is to ask questions. And I realize this is not a small group setting. You don't have to answer. Okay? But, the question on the table is... When was the last time that we were so amazed by what God did that we pursued Him to join it? Okay, when was the last time that you pursued Him to join it? Um, I, I got to hear this psychologist one time. And she was a specialist. Her name is Brene Brown. She's actually kind of getting popular in Indian culture today. Um, but she's a psychologist in the, the area of vulnerability. I know. Who knew there were psychologists specific to vulnerability, right? Um, but she said she was speaking at a big event with CEOs and stuff like this. And um, they had three translators as a team. They came up to her and said, all right, Brene, uh, Dr. Brown, is there any words that are just kind of weird? You wouldn't use them in, in normal, everyday speech. And she said, well, the whole topic is vulnerability, so like, what's your sign of vulnerability? It's not really something I just talk about, or people talk about in everyday languages. They got together and talked about it and said, okay, this is the sign we came up with. You know, ready? Like, weak in the knees. She said, no, 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 that's, that's not where we're headed. That's not vulnerability. Do you have something else? And so they got together. They kept talking about it, and they came back and said, okay, what about this? She said, yes, that's the sign I want. Because to be vulnerable means to reveal something that's going on inside, okay? And, like, this is a, a body of believers, right? This is a church. Um, we all know, if we are followers of Christ and we've read the Bible, we know that we're all sinful. Like, we've, we're all messed up, okay? Um, I've never sat down with a person asked, man, do you think the world's a messed up place? And they're like, yes, every 100%, yes, you can watch the news, it's awful, all right? 
they want to say, well, do you think you're perfect? The answer is always no. I've never met a person that said, yeah, I think I'm perfect. And man, if I did, that's going to be a fantastic conversation. You can't wait. Okay, it's going to be great. But everyone says no. So as believers, who's like basically saying that I follow Christ because I am broken, how weird is it that we don't be vulnerable with each other? We try to put on this perfect face and try to say, hey, I've got my stuff together. That's not what we're about, okay? So let me be vulnerable for a minute. The question on the table is when was the last time we saw God do something and pursued him because of it? There's this guy, I was a sophomore in college, like I said, I was an arrogant underclassman, all right, which, you know, freshman, sophomore in college, I knew it all, of course. Everyone knows that. Um, but I just started leading worship at the BSM. Uh, I was getting off, I think we were, it was like a small group, Bob, nobody knew that were here when I was there. Um, I think it was a small worship service of about 20, like it was really small, but I led worship, it was just me and guitar, um, and sometimes playing all song. And so, like we, we got done, it was about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, I probably had chemistry homework, and I was walking up to the honors hall, um, which was the third floor in the Centennial, and it was really quiet, nobody ever talked up there, they were all doing homework, which is great if you were all about your studies, it's awful if you were an extrovert and wanted to meet people, just nobody, nobody talked. And so, I uh, come in, it's 10.30 at night, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I walk up to my room and there's this guy who's coming down the hall, which is weird. Um, not many people walk the hall, I was on the very end. And so he comes up and said, hey man, do you play guitar? And in my like, tiredness and like, I'm just done with life-ness that was going on, I was like, in my head I went, no man, I just, I just have it, I'm just stashed it in my room. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I play guitar. He said, cool, how long have you been playing? And just so you know about me, more vulnerability, my natural instinct is pride. Like, that's the natural sin that I always kind of, the rut that I always fall into. And I was like, well, I've been playing about 13 years. Like, I've been playing since I was six. And he was like, oh, so you must know what you do. And I was like, I mean, kind of. I, mean, I don't really, I don't know how to answer that question. He said, well, I just bought a guitar last week. I would love to sit down with you and you kind of learn how to play. And I was like, oh, no. I don't want to do that. That requires effort and time. Neither of which I have right now. Um, and to be honest, like this is before I realized that God puts people in our lives that we need to mentor and shape, um, and that nothing happens to us by chance. It's all because God did it, put it that in front of you. And so I was just like, man, you know, that's a great idea. Dude, why don't you swing by my room sometime? I'm usually here doing homework. It's not true. Um, I'm usually, I did my homework in the library. Sorry, sorry. I do homework, so it's not in my room. <laughs> so I need to pronounce that. Um, I said, man, I don't, I'm usually here, why don't you just swing by my room, knock on it, and, and dude, we'll sit out in the jam. I was like, I'll never see him again. And I did, for two years, um, until I went to go vote for uh, student body president. That bro turned around, because he's such an extrovert, naturally made connections with people, was a leader of leaders, and became the student body president of our university. Okay, now he's a close friend, because I said no to God. I missed on the opportunity to, to speak into his life. I missed an opportunity that I had. Okay? The flip side of that story, the great part of that story, is that God didn't really need me. We're going to talk about that later. Um, ended up, God was doing some things in that guy's life already. Um, and he led him to me, and it was supposed to be the perfect. Like, it, it wouldn't, we were, were so similar. Like, it would be fantastic. But instead, I said no. That guy wandered in sin for another year. Um, but then all of a sudden, God gets a hold of his life through some other circumstances. He posts something on Facebook. My boss, the director of BSM, Clay Boyd, saw it because they were mutual friends. He sent a message to him and said, hey man, this doesn't look like your other posts. You want to sit down and talk? They became friends. He went to, with us to Beach Reach and ended up like him and his wife now live and they're doing things for Christ. Awesome guy. God didn't need me. But I missed out on a blessing of a lifetime because I didn't notice that God was moving and seeking out Okay? Crowd man to be a part of what God was doing, and because of that, they got to be a part of one of the biggest miracles in history. Second group of people, the disciples. The disciples lived with and alongside Jesus. Um, they got to go on this three-year camping trip with him, got to see and speak into him Jesus like he was a friend. Love it. My friend is Jesus. That's the, the disciples who said that. We hung out together a lot. Um, but also in the same breath, they gave me hope. The disciples are no schools. Like, throughout the Gospels, like, they just, and they do some weird, wacky things. Like, in Mark 8, 29, Peter, like, Peter walks up to God, and Jesus is having an intense conversation with him. And he says, people say that I am. 
his disciples go, well, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you're a great prophet. Others say you're a great teacher. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And that's a question he asks all of us, and that's another sermon for another day. But who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus prays him and said, because of the Holy Spirit in you, like you were able to say that, that does not come from you. And so... Basically, Peter just said, you are the Son of God. You're the one that has saved your people from the sin that they are in. You are an all-powerful, all-knowing God of the Old Testament. Come to save us. In the next paragraph, Jesus continues on talking about his life and says that I will die. And three days later, I'll be resurrected. And Peter's like, whoa, Jesus. Whoa, hey, come over here. Hey. I mean, I don't know if you should say that. You know, he left his arm around. Jesus, I don't know if you should say that. Like, you may, that's kind of controversial. I don't know if that's political. Politically correct? That's a little too not PC for me. Why don't you not say that? So he says, Jesus, you're the son of God. And then he goes and corrects it. The, the Bible, the ESV says what you said later. Like, there's hope for us, people. There's hope for us, okay? Um, these were the Bible school dropouts. In that culture, like, the highest of highest of honors was to follow a teacher. I mean, they only took the best Bible students throughout the, the time to do that. Um, but if you notice, all the disciples, like, they were all lay people. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. Um, they were not the best of the best. I just I call them vacation and school dropouts. Like, they just didn't make it, okay? That's how I lovingly refer to the disciples. Bible school drop, dropouts. And so, in verse, let's see, 5, Jesus says, lifting up his eyes then, seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Um, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. We have two different answers, all right? Philip and Andrew, so let's read them. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. But then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? So, we have two different answers, two different sides of the podium, okay? Philip, Jesus says, Where are we to find bread? And Philip says, Man, I don't know, like, there's, there's no way this can happen. Like, this is, there's two, there's like 5,000 men here, there's like 200. 200 pieces of denarii wouldn't get him enough to have a bite. Like, there is no big dollar menu. Like, there's none of that right now. So, like, there's, like, Jesus, like, a denarii is about a day's wage, okay? So, 200 days, that's like six months, a little over six months. Even that much money couldn't feed these people. And you remember, Jesus and the disciples are traveling nomads. Like, they're not, they're not operating a huge entrepreneurial business out the back, okay? On the other hand, Andrew doesn't understand Andrew responded and said, I've got this boy with five loaves of bread and two fish, um, but I, I don't know what you're going to do with it. Philip answered with all the challenges that presented. God asked him a question, Philip answered with the challenges. Andrew, on the other hand, even though he didn't understand, answered in obedience. Okay? How's that equate for us? How many times are we posed a question and it seems too big for us? Alright? It just it seems incomprehensible. But Jesus, the power of Christ, like, he can take what little we bring to him and use it for something so much bigger than we could ever imagine. Once somebody once told me, or asked the question of me, if someone, if you wrote down every one of your prayers, and someone got a hold of that book, and the only thing that they knew about God was based on the prayers that you prayed of him and asked of him, how big would they think your God is? Um, and I don't know about you, um, I can only speak to my own, that's being vulnerable, but I can only speak to my own experience. The God of my prayers is pretty small. I put these imaginary borders up, right? That God has to work inside these lines. So Tarleton, for example, 12,000 students. Um, I was asking God, man, God, how can I engage some of these people? When the real question, and a path, like a, a question worthy of an all-knowing, all-powerful God is, God, what is it we need to do to reach this campus, to reach this community, to change the world through these 12,000 students? God, how do we do that? Okay. If people can look at your prayers, how big is the God you pray to? Is it the God of the Bible, or is it a different God? Okay, and really, that's, that's what it is. It's, it seems really bold and kind of, kind of chunky to say, but that's what it is. Okay. Last but not least, let's look at the boy. So this boy shows up. I don't know if he was part of the original group that was on the other side, Sea of Galilee or whatever. I don't really know how old he was. Um, but he shows up, he packs this lunch. He's got five pieces of barley, five loaves of barley, and two fish. Now barley, just so you know, is the most like 
frowned upon bread ever. Like think of pita, okay, it's flat, and then change it to cardboard, okay? And then maybe if you were lucky you had some of that Larry seasoning salt you just put on top of it. It's like, it tastes okay, you know? Okay? It was frowned upon. In, in the Old Testament, if you were caught, I think it was the adulterers, if you were caught, you could only eat barley bread for a while. That was like a severe punishment. Okay, that's, that's the kind of food we're talking about. And then his fish, he, he wasn't like deep fried catfish. He didn't go out to Cook's Fish Barn and like get two pieces of fish. I'm like, yes, fish. Like fresh seafood was a delicacy in the Bible times, right? They didn't have sweet cars with, with fridges in the back that they could put their fish in and keep it fresh. Um, most of the fish that they caught, especially the Sea of Galilee, were pickled. So they had these little minnow type fish that would come and swarm up close to the banks and they would dip in nets and get them and then they'd pickle them and then take them. And so really, this, this boy's not bringing five loaves of bread and two fish. He's bringing like five pieces of cardboard that taste decent and two pickled minnows. Delectable, right? Okay. Delectable. So, um, when he comes to the table with his very little, but when Andrew, the disciple, comes out in the crowds and says, I'm gathering up food to serve to the people. Who would like to give up their food so others can eat? This boy said, you can have mine. And part of me likes to think Andrew was like, okay, because of the disciples and, and kind of like, well, there's this boy here, and he's got some bread and some fish. I don't know. It's kind of a bad idea. I don't know if you've ever been like that, bringing up an idea. It's like, oh, I mean, it's just an idea. It's not really a good one. Here, here it is. It's just because we don't have anything else. But the boy gave up what little he had. Okay. So, again, what does that mean for us? What little do we have? Let me take a brief stand aside for a second. Something we use at Tarleton, BSM, it says image of a velvet brick. Okay? So picture in your mind a brick. This brick is information. And it hurts. When people impact a brick, it hurts. I don't know if you've thrown a brick or got hit by a brick, but it hurts. Okay? I hope it doesn't take too much of a stretch of your imagination to picture that. Um, and sometimes information that we need to have, when it impacts us, it can hurt. So much so that we miss the point of the brick itself, that it's a part of a building. But what happens when you wrap it in velvet is that it's received softly, you can unwrap it, and the message is there in, okay, it's, it's within the brick. And so what we do is there's a student that we need to kind of confront about something, it's velvet brick, right? It's a compliment sandwich, you got a compliment, and then another compliment to end, okay, something like that. And just so, more vulnerability, let me read you my notes, okay? Introduce the concept of velvet brick, and then throw some, okay? So, bear with me real fast. <laughs> Here's my velvet. You guys are great. I love you. You're fantastic. Okay? The brick. And when I say this, hang with me for about 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 8 ish minutes. Okay? Don't miss the first part and, and kind of miss the last part of the book because you, if you walk away from this part of it, you'll you miss the whole point. Velvet brick. You're great. The gospel isn't about. The reason Christ came down, lived his life, died on a cross, suffered, was tortured on a cross, and then rose three days later, was not so that we could feel good, come together in a place and worship. Okay, feel that out with me, all right? Rob Gallantry says, who's a, a pastor at a church somewhere in America, and is kind of known as a discipleship kind of guru, says that the gospel came to you on its way to someone else. In the Old Testament, um, God blessed Abraham so that his people could be a blessing. God didn't take the Israelites and say, oh my gosh, the Israelites messed up again. I'm kicking them out. He picked the Israelites because they were the least. They were the most, the people that ran away from him the most. Every time God came down and did something amazing for the Israelites, they answered and responded with doing something he specifically told them not to. But the reason God kept saving them, and that later progressed into Christ coming down and dying on the cross for us was not so that we could hear the gospel, so that his name could be made great. When he talks about Abraham, he says that he will make of him a great nation, so that through the nation of Abraham, Israel, other nations would be blessed. That comes to fruition in Christ. That's why we're here. We're not originally Jews, we're not originally Israelites. But through Christ, 
That invitation is offered to all of us, so that's why we're here today. Okay. But the gospel isn't about you. Another double brick. I'm just going to throw my grenades, okay? God doesn't need you or your stuff. Bear with me, okay? Um, Psalms 5010 says, For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, I don't know if you read the Old Testament a lot much. I love it. It's, it reads like a, an action flick. It's pretty great. Um, but that's Old Testament speak for God's really rich. It's a mainly agricultural society. When he says that he has the cattle on a thousand hills, that's the equivalent of saying God's riches are forever and ever. Cows keep reproducing. Like it's, it's, it goes on and on forever. God doesn't need us to bring our A game. He didn't die on the cross and say, man, I need Warren and his talents. I need him to hear the gospel so he can be on my team. God doesn't need me. I hope that's evident by that story I shared about that student earlier. Like, I said no. Blatantly. God asked me to do something. I said no. What does he do? God uses another person to see the work that he wanted to done in that young man to come to fruition. God doesn't need me. I've heard it said, my favorite quote, I don't even know who said it. Uh, it's that God can either work through you or in spite of you. God's plan coming to action does not depend on us. But here, like, after throwing all those velvet bricks, bear with me. We'll wrap up. Here's why this is an encouragement. Even though you bring nothing to the table, Jesus' love is so much that he died to save you anyway. There's this thought, and I've, I've hesitated, I've tried to figure out how to best communicate this. You bring nothing to the table, but how much more impressive, how much more how much deeper is God's love that he would send us in his son, even though you had nothing to offer him. I would boldly say that as humans, as finite beings, we cannot process or fathom that kind of love. Um, I love my wife. We've been married over two years. In fact, the first time we showed up to Valley Grove was so we could get on a bus to be um, youth sponsors at youth camp a couple of years ago. It was great. Um, we knew we were supposed to come here after that. It was fantastic. Um, but we've been married two years. And I would love to tell you in my own words that my love for my wife is unconditional. Um, but guys, it's not. If it was unconditional, I wouldn't be frustrated when, when things aren't done. Okay? It's, it rides on so many things. And my wife knows this. I feel like I need to tell you that. Like I, we talked about this earlier. Okay? I am being fed. I'm not gonna, you're not going to find me somewhere under, under roses or somewhere. Okay? Um, but my, like, I get frustrated if things aren't done. Like I get frustrated if... Like, the dishes aren't washed. I'm, I'm telling you things because they're all my jobs. Like, there's things I can do. Um, but my, my love for Sarah is, even though it, it exists, it continues, it's based on certain things. As a human, I can't separate those things. God doesn't work that way. I literally bring nothing to the table when it comes to God, and God still wants me to be a part of the family. He still invites me in. And not only does He invite me in, it costs Him to invite me in. He paid to get something that doesn't give anything back, except praise and glory. And really, all of creation praises him. Like he doesn't need me to do that either. You bring nothing to the table that is yours, but God still desires to use you to make his name known among the nations and the world. What an honor that the God of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing God, who's got all of creation under him, chooses us, the least of the least of, you know, the least inefficient people on the plane to make his name known. The disciples. Think of the disciples. Bible school dropouts. And most of the times in that culture, the students were trained up and they chose a teacher because they were the ones to continue out that message after that teacher died. They were the ones that were going to continue to educate the population. Jesus, counterculture. Jesus comes out, chooses the disciples. And not only did he choose the disciples, he chose the worst ones. He chose the ones that were dropouts. Moses. Moses, we read, has a speech impediment. It doesn't work well. But you know what Moses gets chosen to do? Blows my mind. It's my, one of my favorite stories of the Bible. Moses gets chosen to be the mouthpiece of God to the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh. When you're choosing the voice of God, do you choose the man with the speech impediment? No. Not really. Okay? But... When he chooses the man with the speech impediment to be the voice of God, when he does well and he speaks articulately and moves mountains and does incredible, miraculous things, who does the glory go to? 
The guy with the speech impediment or the guy that spoke through the guy with the speech impediment? The latter. Sorry, that was a question. Sorry. That was a question you don't have to answer. Sorry. The man powering that guy. So, the gospel isn't about you. You bring nothing to the table, but God still died to save us. You bring nothing to the table in years, but God still desires to use you. Um, and you bring nothing to the table, but He still invites us into a relationship with Him to live daily with Him. So here's the question. Are we offering what little we have, which isn't even ours, for God to use for Himself? Because that's what the boy did. What little he had, which was not even his, it was, it was God's, but what little he had, he submitted to the God and said, use this however you want. And because of that, he saw something that was incredible that he could never have imagined on his own. So, are we offering what little we have to God for him to use? So there's three questions in summary. Let me say them and then we'll transition to worship, okay? After I pray for us. But are we seeing what God is doing among us and dropping what's going on to be a part of it like the crowd of people did? Do we see God moving and say, man, I'm going to, it's going to take effort on my part, I'm going to have to move some things around, but I want to join God in what he's doing. Second question, are we hearing Christ's instructions and answering with all the challenges or with obedience, like Philip and Andrew? And last but not least, are we bringing what little we have and giving it to God to use in ways we can't imagine? Now, I don't know where you are this morning, okay? For most people, as, as you walk through the Gospels about you, you bring nothing to the table. Like, we live in a world that media tells us we have to do this perfect ideal, we have to be this perfect person, whether that's in images or what we do or how we do things. It's this, this perfection-based value, okay? And just so we're honest, like, this is coming into the college campus. People are falling short because none of us are perfect, and they have this identity crisis. And people say, I don't know why Jesus would ever want me. I don't bring anything to the table. Those are my words. I don't have anything to offer. The answer every time is, yeah, that's exactly right. You don't have anything to offer. But that's why God's love is so much more important. And so I, I don't know where you're at today. If you're coming here and you're like, man, I have nothing to offer God, but I realize that what little he has given me, I need to give back to him. And I've never committed my life to that. I've never said, Jesus is my Lord. Like, Jesus is the one who has guided me. I'm going to be obedient to that. I don't know if, if that's a decision you've ever made. If not, and you want to do that this morning, I'd love to talk to you about front or in the back or whatever that is. On the flip side of that, if you have started that relationship with Christ, and you're coming this morning and you said that there's parts of my life that God has given me that I haven't given up, and today's the day to give it to me. Why wait? God's going to work through you or inspire you. And to be honest, guys, if God works through you, you get to be a part of that blessing with somebody. So, if there's something that you need to give up, let's do that.